which makes it turn into a YouTube magic moment. There we go. Okay, dropping this into Discord. Um, have I put these help sections in the regular schedule? Probably not. I don't know. Let me just check that real quick, and then we can launch into the question mode. Nah, I don't think I did. Did we do another help session? Yeah, I didn't put them in there. Okay, that's good. Um, all right, let me see. We are, we got, yeah, everything's rolling. It's not the normal rhythm, you know? So, uh, okay. And let me get my, I'm going to get my magic LC3 uh, unit up. And just so we've got that ready to go. If we want to do any like demo stuff or what have you. Okay. You said this is being streamed to YouTube too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. But it would be beneficial to be here during so you can get your questions answered. <laughs> That's right. Or now here's the thing too. Um, and by the way, because I know that um, like Morgan dropped in, um, you know, said, asked lots of questions, right? But, um, you know, people that like anybody else outside, whether they're streaming on YouTube right now or whatever, can drop questions in the chat, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to drop a reply on Morgan. Um, Um, okay, yeah, so topic, <clears throat> yeah, Jay, I think that's not a bad idea. Maybe like a help section thing, I'm not sure. Or maybe over where the topics are or something. Um, yeah, so, wow, that's a pretty good sized group. Um, topic is the project or the large program, whatever we call that thing. Uh, that's topic. And so it is driven by y'alls. So... What you want to know, what's kicking your butt so far. And it can be, you know, high, low, however you want to do it. Um, and I'm just going to start with, with Hannah, okay? Because um, uh, Hannah just dropped a question in. Uh, yeah, because of how long the program is, the LEA can't reach where it's trying to load. Is it bad to put the dot fill in the middle of my code? Yeah, so let's talk about this. This is a, this is a fairly uh, common, not uncommon problem. And one of the reasons why having the program get a little bigger that leads you to this sort of crisis, um, this, you know, tiny programs, PC offset nine or PC offset 11 or whatever the PC offset is, it's like not a problem, you can get there. At a certain size of the program, you can't get there anymore, right? It, it exceeds the uh, the capacity, and um, so the the short answer, Hannah, is absolutely put the dot fill wherever you want. Um, at the point where you get what here's what happens: you wrestle through, you know, getting the code input, you know, into a string or however you're going to do that, and then making sure everything's you know whatever uppercase or lowercase, making it case insensitive. You know what I mean? And you get to that basic, like, okay, I'm just going to do, like, add. That's pretty common. Let's start with just doing add. And you get the A state, the AD, the ADD, and, the, and then the, the good, you know, add opcode kind of state. And then what you realize is you can kind of cop, copy and paste that once that works, you can kind of copy and paste it once you get, you know, once you get the idea figured out. And then at a certain point, everything's great. And then there's a point and then everything breaks. Um, this is also not uncommon and there's a couple ways of fixing it. One is you can move things around so that just the jumps from any one to any other one is not that far. That's, that's an approach. Um, you can try to take play tricks with, um, with, you know, jumps and, and 
you know, load indirect and store indirect. You can try to play those games, um, you know, as a way of getting around the thing, but you still run into some of those same limitations. Uh, the other thing you can do is put your um, dot fills with like variables and things you're going to need uh, and have them local. And some of that can even be inefficient in the sense of like maybe every routine has some local variables just for that routine that are close by. I did that during one one uh, instance that I did when I when I wrote it. Um, I've done it a couple times, um, just trying different things. But that was one thing I did was just every little subroutine or every little you know state right nearby. Those there were the variables for that state. You know what I mean? The the numbers you need to do comparisons and stuff. Um, so. It's a pain in the butt, and it can lead to butt ugly code at that point. Okay, <laughs> but at that point, what you really have understood a great deal, and if you have to make it just a little butt ugly to make it work, I'm okay with that. You know, um, we don't actually have style points. You know, where you know it's the code. Mostly, the code always looks ugly. So, is that Hannah? Is that kind of and I know that I know that you're not the only one. I know that there's a bunch of you that have that exact same question. Um, so let's do, let's deal with that topic here. In you know for for a minute, let's make sure that that topic is resolved. Any other follow up questions before I go to Spencer's question? All right, thanks, Hannah. Anybody else that that's relate that is involved with that same? basic question or that's related to that and you can also jump on voice if you want um, you know and you can drop it in the chat it's fine as well and I'll just read it anybody else on that one Bueller okay um, all right next question but that's a really really I just want to say it again. it's a, it's very common if you get to that part you're not doing anything wrong it's just the nature of a constrained environment that's just part of the struggle of assembly. Is that, and that's why assembly programmers early on, um, you know, things like saving a byte, saving two bytes, saving three bytes could make all the difference in the world. You know, that's why they did some of that stuff because there were just these limitations like that. Okay, I'm going to jump on Spencer's question, okay, <clears throat> which was... Uh, if is it all right if my program halts while running? I'm gonna come. That doesn't make any sense yet. Let me keep reading. I've had to use the dot fill method a couple times because, similar to Hannah, my program's too long to connect certain states. So, so Spencer, you're gonna have to explain. I mean, the my sort of dumb response is every program that halts was running. So, is it all right if my program halts while running? Is is um. It don't make no sense to me, not yet, uh, because I don't know exactly what what uh, what, is, what you're asking. If what's okay, so I'm gonna let you. Um, oh yeah, go Spencer. Oh, I was just gonna say. So like, I have most of my program completed, but um, I've used the dot fill to put some negative numbers into the data registers. Yeah. And yeah. it seems like every time it does that, it will halt um, when, when I run the program, when I'm stepping through it. So is it because you have code and then you just have dot fills and it's running a code and then the next thing it does is grabs what's in the dot fill and treats it like an instruction? Yeah, so I have the dot fills um, as labels and then I'll add the label um, to a data register. I'll load it in and then add it. Yeah, that's all fine. That's not the problem. Okay. Do you have like a little code sample? You know, I mean, it's not going to like, uh, you know, it's not going to be like the winning jackpot for everybody who now knows how to do the program because, but if you have like a little, um, a little code segment around the fill, because my guess is what you might be doing is there's instructions and then comes the dot fill and you've got to jump around that whenever you've got data like a dot fill you have to jump around it otherwise it's gonna and I'm not sure if, if this is what you've done but if it's like does the instruction does you know fetch decodes executes fetch then it grabs like this dot fill 
right, which is just data, it grabs it, fetches it, it decodes it as if it were an instruction, and then it tries to execute it, and then now you're into random function zone. Oh, okay. If that if that's what you're doing, I don't know if you wanted to like look real quick to see. And I have to do something. So while you typically would, in the little <clears throat> programs that we were looking at in assembly, there would be the program, then the halt, mm -hmm. and then, then the dot fill. All of those values. Yeah, but what I could do is go blah, 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 and then do like a, 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 like a branch, like an unconditional branch to just hop ahead a little bit and skip past the fill. Or if I'm doing like a subroutine and I want to do like a JSR, right, to get to my, to, if I wanted to use, you know, I can get to these states different ways, right? I can, I can jump there, I can do like a branch conditional, right? I can do a JSR, I can do a JSRR. I can get to them different ways. And uh, another thing that's not uncommon is right before the code that's in your subroutine, um, you know, we put the dot fills like right above that, you know. So above that, maybe in the code, there's a ret from some other subroutine, you know. You know, it just has to be somewhere where, the, where it's not going to run, where the program counter is never going to point at it. Because if you try to run a fill, it's going to be some strange opcode. If it is, in, if it is, if it even is an opcode, yeah. And mo more than likely, if you're doing well, no, I think about it. No, here's what's happening. In fact, I know exactly what's happening, Spencer. If you have something like, um, okay, spoiler alert. Uh, if I'm looking for a capital A, how would I tell if there's a cap? Let's say I uppercased everything, right? And how do I tell if something's a capital A? Well, you know, and then make a decision based on that. Oh, I have a hint. What if you take the negative of capital A, right? What if you negate the ASCII value of capital A, right? What if you negate it? You're going to get a negative number. If you add that to the number that you just pulled out of the string, this is adding, right? And if that comes out to be zero, what do you know about those two values? They were the same, right? that you know that those are the same. Cool? Okay, so that's how you can do comparisons of letters. Like, is that the letter I'm looking for? I take the negative. Okay, if I do a dot fill with the negative of, say, capital A, what are the first four bits going to be? F. I mean, one, 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 one. Exactly. Both correct. You're sign extending it. Yeah, that's right. You sign. You take that negative number, which is going to have a one out on the left of it. Sign extend it. But I mean, you take the ASCII value of something, and it's going to have a bunch of zeros, and then the value. When you take the negative of that value, it's going to be all ones out on the left. Okay. What is the what is the instruction that goes to one 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 as an opcode? I mean, you know, like what's what's that opcode? Isn't that not? No. 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 No, it's a trap. It's trap. Now what are you doing? And where is it going? Something funky with the operating system. Something probably. funky. Right, exactly. It's going to basically just call. It's going to go to uh, the trap table. And it's going to index into the trap table with those eight bits, right, from zero to FF, the last little bit. And it's going to be some rando number. It's not going to be the ones we know. It's not going to be, you know, 20, you know, hex 2021 20, through 25, whatever. It's not going to be those. It's going to be something else. And it turns out, we, we actually talked about this, but it, it turns out that every single one of those other trap routine, there's, okay, every other spot in the trap table. Can I, I'm just going to show it to you right now. Let's just go to um, address zero. Okay, do you see what's here? FD00, on and on and on. What it does by default is the LC3, wherever it doesn't have a built-in trap instruction, like there's, you know, there's trap 20, there's 21, 22, 3, 4, 5, which is the, the halt, right? And goes back to FD00. So what happens if you go now to FD00, Okay, 
this is the default uh, trap instruction if you call a trap instruction that doesn't exist. This is what gets called. And I'll bet you, Spencer, confirm or deny, it's going to go blah, blah, blah. It's going to load. It stores away R7 because that's the return value. It stores away R0 because it's about to use it. Then it loads from FD0A, which is... Uh, I don't even know. That's just, it's, it's null. So it's going to load that value into R0 and it's going to spit it out. And then it's going to put a string that starts at FD0B and that's also null. So nothing's going to happen. Um, in fact, I'm going to do this one better because we're just going to go there. Let's run it. Okay. So spits nothing, spits nothing, and then what does it do? Halts. So that's what's happening, Spencer. I'll bet you dollars. Okay, you have thanks. right? Doesn't that make doesn't that make perfect sense? You take the ASCII character, flip everything, add one. Leftmost still says it's a trap. Rando spot in the trap table. You go to FD zero zero. Boom. Yeah. And the other thing you can do, Spencer, to confirm that is set a breakpoint even, you know, and, and just go to it. And then at that point, stop and drop in and you're going to be right here. That's my guess. Okay. All right. I think we beat that one to death. But it's not uncommon. It's a conceptual thing. You have to understand the, the program, the LC3, the assembler thing, machine language, it just grabbed fetch, decode, execute, increment the program counter, fetch. It, you know, it just does the same thing every time, unless there's a branch. It's going to grab the next one, treat it like an instruction, right? How does the computer know what these things are? Social contract. Well, the social contract is that if I fetch it, because the program counter points at it, it's an instruction. I get out of my way, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to decode and execute that instruction. That's the rule. That's the social contract. Okay. Next question. Next question. I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if we need to check uh, for both the, like, here's a, like a two part question. So if we need to check for both the <clears throat> carriage return and the new line feed, like LF and CR when we're writing the program or, cause yeah. I was just checking for the value a well hex a or 10 in decimal yep when so the, yeah the the end that's a question let's let's talk about it for just a second um and so let me see where are we at yeah let me let me talk about this and it relates to another question that i've had okay from this from you guys from uh from your fellow students, which is how do I how do I tell what gets and you know the one of the questions is what happens when I press you know when when they ent when they do the enter key how do I know what I'm supposed to be looking for okay um, and I've had that question a couple times well the the answer let's let's figure out the answer right now so let's just start by. Uh, started off at three at uh, three zero zero zero, and do um, get C. And in fact, that's all I want to do right now. Is just get C, and then we'll just halt, and that's it. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step. Now, remember, this step enters a subroutine if there is one. This next skips, fully executes that line and does the next one. Well, get C is a subroutine. It's a trap routine. So when I say next, it freezes because it's waiting for input, okay? Now, what I'm going to do here, I, I highlight another thing that's been mysterious. You touch the console, it's now highlighted. Now your keyboard is the keyboard input to your program, okay? If you mouse off that or you click off of that, now it's not. Now I'm just Q 
keyboard for my laptop. If I click onto it, my keyboard is going into the LC3. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the enter key and all you want, all you're looking at is R0. Because get C returns uh, that value. Boom. A. And in fact, notice down here that this is one of the ways you can configure it. New line as hex zero A. Okay. Now let's try this. I'm not even sure if this will work, but I'm going to, I'm going to reset everything and I'm going to do next again, highlight. Okay. Notice what I got D because I basically, in other words, the, this LC three simulator allows you to tell what is that going to be the standard. It always comes defaulted with the new line being zero a that's the way we're going to test it. And I, my recommendation is don't fiddle with that. Pick one. But what's interesting is there are some systems where when you press enter, it generates two characters. One is the carriage return and the other one is the line feed. Now, my question is, is does the LC three work like that? How's the LC three work? resetting everything back, right? How's the LC3 work? Well, if I say next, I, I click here again and I press the enter, right? You see what I got? It's there. There's nothing else in the input buffer. It only generates one character. You can tell it by, ch by checking, but you're like, well, what if, what if I don't know if I trust that? Now let me do two get C's back to back. Let's try that and clear the registers and then go, okay, I'm going to do, I'm in the middle of the first get C. I press enter. If there was a mystery second character hanging out there, then when I click next again, it would, you know, it would be consumed and show up in R zero, but it doesn't, it's waiting again. Like what, 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 you know, now I can go like lowercase K six B. Okay. And then I'm done. So I can, I can figure out what the computer's actually given me. Okay. Um, okay. I hope that helps. Um, let me see. I had kind of a general yeah. question. Yeah. Does it make sense? I put it in text chat, but I might as well ask it now. Um, does it make sense to save the address of particular subroutines in a register if you want to be able to go to that subroutine from yeah. anywhere? Yeah, absolutely. And then the only gotcha at all ever is that um, you can, um, in fact, that's not bad, right? That's because one of the approaches is it's like, let's just say that every time you went to do some jumping, it was all kind of close by, except for like error. That guy, you know, because everybody's got to jump to that guy. You know what I mean? Right? Well, one approach is to put that address for that routine, you know, into a register and hang on to it. Right? Okay. Now, that was the... actually exactly what I was asking about is because from, like, if I'm checking, I'm scanning through the string that the user put in. If I'm checking each of the letters and something is an invalid command, I want to be able to jump to the error state from anywhere right. in the program, whether I'm That's scanning right. A or whether I'm scanning L or whether I'm scanning Q, that area. And so yeah. what I'm wondering is, should I put the address every like 256 lines so that everyone can access it no matter what? Or should I just save it in R6 yeah. and say, mm -hmm. go to R6? No, the event, right. And the other, the other, the other struggle is even getting it in there. There's a, there's a change that Zach and I are committed to making to the, to the, to the simulator over the Christmas break, but it is, um, the ability to have the labels be accessible anywhere. Uh, and I'm not talking about PC offset is still kind of screwed when it comes to, you know what I mean? Stuff far away, but at least have the ability to like create your own jump table, you know what I mean? And then keep like a, a, a register that, that has an address of that jump table, for example, right? Keep that, keep that guy always around with you. You know, the alternative is you could, you could do something like start with dot orange, you know, 3000, for example, and maybe the very first thing you have in right there, uh, this isn't going to work. 
is like, but like a jump or something to goes around it. And then you know that what the address of that routine is so that you can, you know what I mean? So you can lower, it's close. And anyway, if it's close enough that you can grab the label while you're nearby and then hang on to it, you know what so I mean? If errors label, way at the end. Once the assembler has run, labels are saved in <clears throat> jump table. But in then, the state table. In this, state. sorry, sorry, sorry. What's it called? It's called... The label table? No, come on. We're, I'm so dumb right now. I must be tired. Manage labels. It's called... Help me somebody. What do we call this thing? So click, so click on assemble. No, not until I know this answer. It's going to tell you the answer. What? Because it's going to say download custom X table. Wait, okay, click where? So exit out of there. Okay. We're done. Scroll down. Assemble. Assemble. No, come on. It's right out of my own lectures. Okay, assemble button. Assemble It'll table. tell you. Symbol table. Why? Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay, we got to stop. I'm, I chamber. obviously got to go to bed or something. <laughs> then if you click on <laughs> assemble, it'll say download symbol table. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Um, but wait, what I'm it, wondering wait, wait, is... Wait, wait, wait. Where does it say download a symbol table? After you click assemble. Left. Downloads oh, this is to get it like, okay, what is, I don't think I've ever actually done that. Okay, how goofy is that? No worries, it happens. What no, I was wondering I know, is, sorry, sorry, but okay, keep going. Is there a way, so if I don't know what the final address of the error subroutine is, is there a way that I can, in assembly language, write Div code so that it will load the machine address for this, error in Arctic. This is part of the problem. This is actually part of the thing that we're, that we're talking about fixing. Because the problem is, if it's way the heck out there, like, how do I do that, right? Well, you know, it, it gets extra tricky. I want to be able to build myself a jump table with all the addresses I care about, like now. You know what I mean? I want to be able to, for example, go dot fill label. That's one thing I want to be able to do. That would be right? great. That would be great. You know, and why can't I? It's in the symbol table. The problem is it takes a third pass on the compiler, on the assembler, which okay. I'm okay with that. So you know? in order to do something like that, I would have to manually find wherever, like, right. look at the symbol table and find wherever, whatever address it gave to my label for error state and then <laughs> copy that address and put it in a dot fill. You right, but see, and that's the problem. Well, yeah, no, that you could do that. Actually, yes. yes. Kind of tedious, but workable. Super, well, right, but and workable in the following way, Chris. If you, because um, it has to be something that comes self-contained to us to be able to run it, right? But if you oh. have it, it's like, it's working. I know it's working, you know, and I assemble it. I have a dot fill that's going to hold on to that. Ooh, 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 I just realized this is the kludge. This is the kludge to make a symbol table. I mean, so, a, a, I mean a jump table. No, we, we, and let me finish the this thought sure. here. The idea is simply that that when I know the thing works, I've just got a bunch of dot fills right here. I assemble the thing. It's not going to work. Not going to run because the stuff's not there. I then manually inspect via via this download the symbol table. What those are? Then I then I go back within my own program and add those hard coded numbers because they're the hard coded numbers that I now know. Once, it, once it's working, if I change anything, if I add or delete any line, those are going to be all screwed up and I've got to redo that step. But having hard coded those values, you know, into my program, they would in fact reflect the entire sure. program. So is that something that's okay for us to do when we're testing oh, or is it, is oh, it yeah. something where you want to be like, hey, we need to be able to take your program, change the address of the orange. And no, still have no, to work. No, no, no. You're gonna no, because you're gonna give me your assembly file. Okay. And your assembly file is gonna come with its own dot orage. Okay. Yeah. But no, seriously, okay. Chris, I've been i I've been noodling for I mean, not like all day every day, but I've been noodling for about a year over the inadequacy of the ability to make a jump table. Okay. 
in LC3 and with that tool. And, uh, and one of the ways around that is dot fill label. That's a good way, right? Um, and uh, what was the other one? The other way was to allow multiple dot origins. So you go dot origin 3000, then it's like dot origin 3100, and here comes, you know, state A. 3200, state AD, right? And you could, and that way you could kind of like, can you do multiple dot origins in a in an assembly file? Yes, conceptually. However, with this assembler, you can do like a th like dot orge, do the thing, and then like grab another file, drop it in with a different dot orge, and drop that in. The other stuff will stay in memory. Another memory, another memory. The problem is there's not an automagical way that I know of in this simulator to just do that. I want to be able to go dot orge three thousand, go for a while. Dot org, and then just dot org thirty one hundred. All you're doing is changing the location counter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you I can hard code the start addresses. Yeah. Which you could actually do in BASIC, which used line numbers. The original BASIC used line numbers. Anyway, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but is that what you would recommend for things like the error state, where you run through? find where it has the label and then just manually put dot fill X, wherever that address is. It's okay. I mean, bottom line is if I get the code and it has this assembly file, right. And then, mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of like dot fill and then it's just random numbers and they just happen to be like hard coded values to where it's going to go. Yeah. That's not a problem okay. at all. Okay. That was my main general question. Um, but this is truly mind-blowing for me because I've been noodling over how to make a bloody jump table with this simulator. And this is the best way I've thought of so far. And so thanks for sparking that. Just out of curiosity, how do you, do you know how to view the, or is it possible to view the code for this LC3? I know oh, yeah. this is a GitHub page, but... I, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. No, it's a GitHub page. No, that's exactly right. Um... I can, I mean, real quickly, we can go look at it. It's, um, let's do that kind of later. You okay. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or I, just, I can even post it maybe if we can, or maybe, I don't know, Zach, if, if you wanted to like, just jump on the GitHub thing there. I did it one time. It's basically, it's LC3, you know, web, you know, something like that. Only it's, um, uh, maybe that's not the one. I can't remember exactly. I think I had to do something like go to GitHub and then just search for, there's our guy right there, uh, William Chargin. He's the guy. We actually owe him a debt. And then I think we did something like W Chargin. Yeah, and then we could do repositories and let me just see. Um, there we go. Right here, LC3 web. Wait, so what was the difference there? Oh, it was just, it was not wcharging.github. It's just, that's, that's it right there. Um, and I'm just going to drop that into the chat, okay? Awesome. Thanks. And that, yeah, and that's code. So we're going to play. In fact, if anybody wants to play around with the code over the, the holiday break, um, let me know because I want to piddle around with it a little bit. Cool opportunity to just do a little project, do a little researchy thing. Uh, we could maybe write a little undergrad research paper somewhere, you know what I mean? For grins, uh, that can open up certain, you know, it's a dumb little pub, but I mean, I think it would be kind of cool you know, to actually do those changes, do it as a collaborative thing, write it up, make a paper out of it. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me go. I'm going to go back. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah. Um, let me see. Jay hit me up on DM and then we talk specifically about, you know, the, the specific things that are not working on a given exam. Um, Michael, how the heck do I even get a whole string? Um, you can't actually just, there's, well, the answer is actually really simple. What's a string? 
uh, it's a bunch of characters, right? And the answer is, you get a character, and you put it in memory, and you get another character, and you, get the next one. And okay. you put it in memory, and you get the next one, put it in memory. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm right? And then when they press enter, you stick a zero. And how do you, how do you know, how do you have space in memory so to put the like string? Put, do you put them, okay, I'm, I'm a little behind in my understanding of like LC3 and assembly stuff. So like, I don't, when you say put it in memory, it's not a register. You mean put it into a, like, yep. Some kind of, there's some location in some memory. location in memory. Yeah. And the cleanest way to do that, if you're going to have like a string, do like a block, you know, the dot BLKW, right? The dot block W. Um, okay. And if like you maybe you just want to have 20 characters or 80 characters or whatever, right? Block W 80, you know, that you just reserve that that just blocks out the space. And as long as you've got that label, you know, you can write that into memory at that location. You can increment that value, right? Okay. Now you're just moving and the so index through. When you're. Um like you get the first letter, uh, ASCII values are like what two, two bytes, or one one byte. Okay. I mean, they they can be two bytes, double byte ASCII, but we're doing one byte LC three, just that <laughs> you know, just that eight bit ASCII. Okay. Um, Is it eight or seven? Either way, it's only one byte. <laughs> I, okay, I just I guess I need to look in to see how that works and how adding characters to the block W works. Yep, all you're doing is writing to a location in memory. Okay, that's all you're doing. Um, okay, let me it's keep be going. A struggle for me, but yeah. We'll, we'll, well right, and the and the key there is double back to where we're talking about that, and you know what I mean. Work the specific skills, and then you know add that back. Um. Okay. Michelle, short program to show us how to effectively use the LC3 simulator. This is an interesting question because I, I, let me, let me do this actually. The way I'm going to approach that, Michelle, number one, we've certainly done, you know, I've done this in lectures, right? Where I'm pulling something up and dropping it in and, and we were actually doing it even like right now, right? And what I probably, I don't know, we did, anyway, we've done little bits of it. Um, what I don't want to, what I'd rather do is talk about, at least for now, is talk about um, the, the project, the larger program. And then if we sort of have time, we can maybe come back and, and answer specific questions about the LC3 simulator, about this one, which is quite a good one, I think. Um, is that cool, Michelle? Uh, and in the meantime, we're using it. So... You know, it's just not like a direct tutorial on it, if that makes sense. Is that cool, Michelle? And even if it's not cool, I'm moving on. Okay, Chris, let me see. Um, more general question. Does it make sense to save the address? Is this the same thing, Chris? Um... Um, yeah, that's the same one we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, that's the that. one. I put it in text chat because we were kind of busy. But yep. when I saw the moment, I asked it in voice. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, yeah. So Zach also dropped in relative to Michael's. If you're talking about, and I think, may actually, I think Zach addressed another angle. If you're trying to read in a string like we're doing when somebody types their thing and you're trying to read that in. It was when you said, when you said, Michael, how the heck do I even get a whole string? Yeah. Uh, the string Z one, I understood. Okay. I, I, I use that to display my, my message. Exactly. Yeah, um, that's right. So, and I wanted to make sure that that's the, if you're building it into the program, then dot string Z perfect. If you're, you know, getting it from the user, then you got to read it a character I mean. at a time. Exactly. Okay. okay. Oh, I did have another question specifically regarding the strings assembly command. When you are, wait, you mean you string Z? Yeah. String okay. Z. I was like strings. 
Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, your your S and Z. <coughs> just to be clear that we're I, talking about the same thing. Yeah, string Z. Um, when you use that, does it also automatically allocate a space at the end for zero? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's, okay. do Let's do it. Let's do it. Because I wanted to make sure I didn't have to include a zero and like do like a fill zero at the end of my strings. So yeah. That my loop to display the string would properly close. Yeah. Let's do this. What I'm going to do is actually we're just going to take the same code that we did, only I'm going to make a label called go. Um, and in between those, I'm going to do a dot, no, sorry, a dot string. I say string Z just because strings is too ambiguous, but it's not like wrong or right. You know? um, and then I'm going to do... Okay, and then here comes, and I'm going to just put these here just to align them, you know what I mean, so that the code just kind of, you know, looks cleaner, since actually I'm a doofus, hang tight. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so you see what we've done? I'm branching, I put the dot string Z right here. And then I'm branching around it at right out of the chute. So we should be able to see this, this stuff right here. And what we should see is three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There should be nine uh, characters. Okay. So notice the first thing we get is, the, is the, the unconditional branch over here to go. See the label right there? There's our get C's. And what do you see right here? Because I know you have the ASCII table memorized. You probably have like capital Y, O, period, space, I recognize. Sup, uh, sup. And then there's a period. See the period there? 2E and 2E. And then there's the zero. Ooh, and then let's do this. Let's do this. What we'll do is we will, um, when, as soon as they enter any character, we go let me see we'll go s for string and then we have to um we have to load we have to take the address uh the address has to go into r zero right which i think is the lea um r zero from s is that correct i'm rolling without looking this up which i said you shouldn't do and then I'm going to do put S. See if I'm a friggin' genius or not. So I go, and I'm going to step through it. So we go next. And then I'm doing next again. So it's just waiting for any key press. All right. Then I do that guy. Then I do that guy. Oh, yeah. And in fact, we can even... Um, let me do this again. I'm just going to say run. Actually, let me clear the output just because it's running now. It's waiting for my key press. Uh -huh. And then it's not going to stop until I hit another key because we had double get C's, remember? Quick question. Would, would anybody be able to like put in the documentation on the block W, string Z kind of stuff? Because... I'm looking at this one, the one Appendix A thing for the LC3 that's been used and tossed around before, but it doesn't have anything about Block W. Um, yeah, it's on, it's on, it should be on Canvas. Um, yeah, it should be on Canvas under pseudo ops. I'll show you um, what that doc looks like. It's this guy right here, which shows the dot orge, dot fill, dot block W. String Z dot end. Okay. Yeah, that would. But but anyway, and it should be sitting out there on Canvas. It's also in the book. If you have the book, it's on the book. It's on yeah, the book. I did it's in yeah, the so. book. And there's a section called book appendices. And I'm just double checking. Yeah, it's there. 
Yeah, it's Where called would it be under files on canvas. Yeah. If you go to canvas under files, there's a lot of files. Mm -hmm. got like, yeah. Uh, okay. I guess I'll just look, well, look through it. And yeah. So it's the one called book appendices. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, in fact, let me the pseudo ops pages one through three. Yeah, so go to files, go to book appendices, then way at the bottom here is pseudo ops. And it's Can I make that of all the pages? Fit? Yeah, and it's kind of <laughs> shrunk a little bit. Yeah. It's got like an individual JPEG of these pages and then a PDF of, of that of the two page document. Okay. Perfect. Cool, Thank cool. You. Yeah. Okay, where are we at? Let me come back. Let me see. Um, all right. Okay, so Tyler asked, do we need to store the new line character in memory where we're storing the user input? No. No. Uh, I would definitely not because the that enter key is your indicator that they're done. It's not part of the string, right? And so um, what you want to do is, where are we at? Um, yeah, exactly what Tyler said. Um, just put a zero, right, to represent the null termination of the string. So, you know, like this one right here, for example, we could set up a little loop, you know, and just like get the character and you're checking every single time to see is that character zero A? And you're going to check it by comparing it with negative zero A, right? And whenever those are zero, boom, they just press the enter key. And at that point, you know, you've got your, you've got your index ready, you know, to, to, to point to the next spot for the next character. They say enter, throw a zero in there. That's not because zero is the enter key, but because the enter means they're done, and the zero is the end or the termination of the string. And when you start processing a string, the social contract is you're doing every, you keep going until it's not, uh, as, until it's a zero. Numeric zero. All the bits are zero. That's how you know the string has ended. Cool. Um, Tyler, that's, yeah. that's, that's throw there, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Yep. And then Chris just kind of clarified, right? Yeah. The numeric zero is all the bits are zero. That's the number zero, which I think in the ASCII table actually says null, right? And uh, that's not the character zero. That's critical, critical. Okay, next up. These are good questions. These are, these are not uncommon. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, the ASCII, the ASCII character zero is uh, three zero hex. Okay, what's up next? What else is uh, making you crazy? Well, I, I don't want to hear about your relationship problems. Let's keep it. <laughs> let's keep it to uh, this stuff right here. How about my relationship problems with computers? Is that... My computer left me for another man. <laughs> I didn't have enough RAM. Okay, that's all. We're stopping. I'm going to... I'm pulling the plug on you now. Okay, what else we got related? I apologize for even hinting at that direction. Uh, Could I share the large state diagram that I made and showed you the other day? Um... Yee. Mm, this is a good question, actually. Because the part of the labor, what I wanted everybody to do. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did my famous uh, whiteboard of paper. I don't know exactly what you think. Um, what I don't want to do is like, oh, screenshot. Oh, I got that one done. Yeah. I you know, understand. Um, then I guess one thing... I mean, it's not a mystery. I'm not... You know what I mean? I, I, on the one hand, I want to just go, yeah. On the other hand, there's a lot of that thinking through that's really part of the exercise. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to short that. For sure. You know, because um, the truth is, anybody who actually grabbed that, 
is not going to finish the project. That's almost That's true. universally true. Um, one thing that I would love <clears throat> to talk about real quick is that I found this sample subroutine in the book. I don't know if everyone already like found everything, but I came across this and I thought it was super helpful because it contained um, a useful device which at the beginning of your like at the beginning of your subroutine you can in subroutine you can include these commands to save what you currently have in R1, R2, R3 right. in something just below your subroutine. And at the end of your subroutine, you can restore those. Yeah. So it gives you more registers to work with within the subroutine. True. Without yeah. sacrificing those those registers in the rest of your program. Yeah, that's right. And I thought that, that was super yeah. it really opened my eyes to how to think about that. Well, I think that's I think that's super helpful. The other thing that you do when you're doing uh, when you're doing um, uh, assembly language programming, it's not, it's not uncommon to, you know, you're about to use some register in the, in the middle of something to like push it on the stack, use some stuff, pop it back off. Like that's not uncommon to like, you're about to trash something, save it before you trash it and put it back. And since the LC3 doesn't have a um a push and pop built-in you know instruction uh this is how you would do that but yeah that's a good one um okay what else we got we, we've been going a little less than an hour and i'm okay time wise but uh other questions that are nagging at you relative to the um you know relative to the project All right, um, let me see. So Brianna just said, so I'm a little confused. I'm trying to figure out how to test to see if it is like one of the correct values. So I don't know what it is. So let me, and I may need a, some clarification. Okay, Brianna. But uh, how would I go about comparing the values to test if it's in the, if it's, if it is the right character? I know how I would do an equals to using, equals to using an add function. But it doesn't seem so. So, Brianna, help me understand why, you know, why it and you can jump on voice as well if you'd like. But, um, you know, why that feels like not a logical choice. Because because any anything you want to add there. And, and basically, trying to do an equals using an add function is, is, to be clear, what I think you mean by that, and I think the standard way of thinking about that, is that I take some, and by the way, this is when I, when I have a, a machine language or an assembly language that doesn't include an equivalence operator, okay? There's even in some languages like a branch on equal, branch not equal, things like that. Um, again, it's all dependent upon the instruction set architecture. But in this kind of a rudimentary world, I take, this, I take these two things. I don't know if they're the same. One of them I negate. This is, isn't that brilliant negation? And then I add them together. And if they come out to be zero, then I know that they were equal. And if they're not zero, they were not equal. I have a branch on zero, which at that point, essentially becomes equivalent to a branch on equal. And I also have a branch on not zero. It's called BRNP. If it's negative or positive, you know, it's the same as not equal, right? Um, and so when you're doing characters, this is, the, this is kind of the cool, tricky part. When you're doing characters... At, you know, I want to know if this character is the same as this other character. Well, sure, I know that they're characters, but I can also just say, for now, forget how I interpret them. I want to just know if these bits are the same as these bits. 
Well, how can I tell? I can negate this, treat this as if it were a twos complement number and negate it. Then add them together. If they were the same, it's going to give you zero. So it's exactly the same, right? And the fact that I know that that was a character, great. Could have also been pixels. Could have been anything, right? Um, anyway, so let's go back to, so the follow-up then, we're gonna, um, so the reason I don't think it's a logical choice, I guess, is that you'd have to put in a bunch of values to say, okay, so if we're looking for an A, then we could subtract 41 from the value stored in whatever chosen register. And if it equals zero, then it can move on. But we would need to do this for every value being checked. Correct. Seems like a lot of tasks. Correct. It's okay. It's okay. You can literally do that, you know, a million times. The computer doesn't care. Not trying to be flippant, but I mean, like, seriously, Brianna? Okay. Um... And uh, that makes sense that it just, it's okay. You, and literally, because what you're going to do, you're going to check to see, is it an A? Is it a B? Uh, you know, I don't know well, what else works. C, no, D, no, E, no, F. Uh, you know what I mean? You know, there's going to be a bunch that are that are valid, and then the, there's a majority that are not valid. And you're really just trying to say, essentially, it's like a big switch statement or like a big if-then-else, right? If the character equals A, then do a thing. Else, do another thing. Else, you know, else if it's this, do another thing. Else if it's this, you know, yeah. And that's part of what you have to kind of architect out. And, and sort of, you know, and sort of design is how are you going to do that exactly? You know, you could have a whole set of values and set up a little loop to take this value and compare it to all of these different values, right? To see which, you know, to see if it finally matches. But if that's correct, like if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, the very first character and you look at it and it's an A, well, then you need to go to the A state. So you need to, at some point, do that comparison and then jump on zero to the A state. And then over in the A state, you got to look at the next character. Now, it gets easier the further out you get, right? Initially, you got, uh, I don't remember what all the instructions are off the top of my head. But you know that A is valid, B is valid. valid. We know J, S, L, Q for quit, um, T for trap. And there's another, there's a few others, right? You know what I'm talking about. Um, so you've got to check all those. But when you've got like an N, the only thing you have to check is, is it an O or isn't it? If it's an O, you can go to the NO state and you're still alive. If it's not an O, dead. Got to go to the error state. So it does get simpler later, but initially, yeah. So does that make sense, Brianna? Does that answer the question really, you know, as you know, as much of all as all that? Okay, cool, cool. All right. Um, what else you got? I feel like there. I feel like we're winding down. I feel like there's just f the and the questions that you hit right out of the shoot were kind of the big ones, the big designy kinds of ones. What do you say? Anybody else got stuff that's nagging? Is it bad that I didn't do an error state? Um, wait, who said that? Oh, Zach, did you not do an error state when you did yours? No. Did you replicate the error behavior like ev over and over and over and over again? What do you mean by that? I mean, if you don't have an error state, you still have to deal with I mean, essentially, there, there's either one spot that everybody goes when they fail or, the, or what it is you do when you fail has to be done, you know, has to be built into, like, every state. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, no, I didn't do either one of those. I had a main function, 
and when you finished the state machine, you would you do a ret back to that main, and oh, the main and the handler for the air. Okay. If an error comes <clears throat> In other words, right? You'd you'd come you'd come rolling back with the value of whether you were good yeah. or not. Yeah. Kind of like return zero and C. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's cool. No, that's okay. Yeah, I had a main function that it was kind yeah. of nice to organize the whole like overarching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's you. That's that's cool too, right? Um. Okay. Let me see. Do we got anything else? Once Zach and I are, once Zach and I start reminiscing about how we wrote this code, we we might be close to done. Michael, I mean, I'd love just the answer to the whole thing, but <laughs> there isn't one. <laughs> Here's like, a good like, thing to keep in mind, though. You know, our working programs. A lot of people like to implement this project in a linear fashion, hence the reason you always get problems with offsets getting out of range. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, you could save yourself a lot of that trouble with the messy, ugly code of offsetting around by implementing your state machine like a tree-like structure, or tree-like structure, if that means anything to you. But the tree-like structure saves, at least to a certain extent, it's going to save you the offsets. You know, if the program was any bigger than what it's it is... It's going to keep stuff together, in other words. Right. If the program was yeah. any bigger than what it is, eventually yeah. your trees, you know... It's mathematically, it's going to just grow unmanageable. Yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. for the for the size of the program, the tree-like structure saves you from having to worry about how you're going to offset around because everything stays within within its parent. So each child state stays within its parent state as far as offsets go. So that that's what I did. Yeah. Okay. That's not that's, that's good advice. That's good. You know. But yeah, Michael, I mean, you know, the answer, and, and first of all, I mean, without being flippant, there really isn't like an answer, you know what I mean, per se, uh, in the sense that you can write this thing with probably a half a dozen broadly different strategies. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, and then, I yeah. That, yeah. So it's just, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out one. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I've made, I may know have an idea on my, in my mind what to do. Yeah. But it's like the how to do it is really hard yep. for me. Yep. And that's actually <clears throat> why, you know, one of the things we tried to do with, um, when's it really start? Module six, seven, eight, right? It's kind of like easing you into programming, small little programming tasks. As you nail those, you're kind of building the, the, the smaller skills. You know what I mean? You know, how to dribble, yeah. how to hit a layup, how to pass, you know, and and out of those that's fundamentals. Like where I'm where I'm at now and the homework is number eight. Yeah. So that's I'm pretty behind. Yeah, fair enough. But that'll I mean that definitely reflects, you know, that it's gonna be harder from right there to try to jump ahead. But um but also it's why we're around if you have specific questions like I'm stuck on the one thing, I mean obviously do the due diligence, right? But but where oh, there yeah. are Questions. I'm trying to look around to see, figure out how to ways around these problems, but it's yeah, it's assembly language, so nobody really. I mean, not a lot of people use it, so there's not really. Well, right, and the struggle is um, that they're all different, so that that's why the yeah. concepts and the and the specific principles and but at the end of the day, this this simulator is your friend. This simulator is where you should be sort of doing everything. Um, and spending a lot of time. If you're noodling it on paper, you're, you're, you know, you're short at least a leg, maybe more, you know, in terms of learning, growing, you know, uh, having the assistance. Well, so. I mean, yeah, you got to code. You got to actually code. Like, got it. Yeah, that's right. Be, I, I, how good would you be at Python if you wrote all your Python code on paper? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not really that good at Python. <laughs> you get you get what I mean, but yeah. like you know, you gotta you gotta practice. You gotta troubleshoot. Yeah. You gotta learn that's really how, where it's how at. How the assembly code executes, and then when you with with that experience, you'll be more prepared to actually code in assembly. You know? Yeah. Okay. Do we have anything? And and seriously, Michael. Obviously, you know, grab me, grab Vlad or uh, Zach. You know what I mean? With, with specific questions, we can help you with. Um, you know, what's the answer? Too, too broad 
Um, I can't get get C to work. I think I understand it, but I maybe I'm stuck. Is it, that's a valid question, you know. So, you know what I mean. You know, definitely hit us up, okay? Um, yeah. So, do we have anybody else got anything else that you want me to hit before we uh, call it call it good? Um, you know, just to put out this as a recommendation, the very first thing you should do with this large program is test if you can write a little you know, little functionality for getting your input and see if you can put that to a console and see if you're actually getting an input, echoing it back. Yeah. Uh, implement yeah. your case and sensitivity. See if you can make it so that you can get an input and also change it to be, you know, whatever you want your standard to be, like uppercase or lowercase, whatever you're going to be testing for. And then see if you can get that to a console just to test yourself along the way. Once you've got like functionality for getting your input in and getting your case and sensitivity set up, then then I'd recommend setting up just a little bit like of a mini state machine for like one of the instructions, just to get an idea how you're actually going to test uh, an, an instruction that's typed in in a state machine like way. Once you get an idea for all that, and once you've got that working right, then implementing the whole state machine as a greater structure is going to be pretty um, straightforward. Pretty, pretty straightforward, yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. I, I, I second everything that Zach just said. Um, it, it relates strongly to what I said earlier about um, when you're doing any kind of code, do the first thing and know that it is right, you know. And your first task, for example, is like to spit your message out, you know. Enter, enter an instruction, right, whatever, right. Your little introductory messages. You get that working and it's like building Hello World. You're like, okay, that part worked. Okay, I'm ready for the next part, you know get your loop going that you can enter characters till they say enter and then and then turn around and put s you know get that value back in in r0 spit out put s so that you can you know i typed a string i'm i'm echoing it back as they type it and then i'm spitting the whole thing out you know play around just keep, make sure that every step is good and works it's and so yeah exactly what zach said i think is right on the money um it will help you um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bail. Are we good? Last chance. I'm gonna call that done. Good luck. It is the last week of the semester. Good luck to everybody. God bless us, everyone. <laughs>